in the forest tradition, it's rare that someone would be practicing metta as their basic practice. As John Munn said, you have to focus on the body and deal with the issues around the body if you're going to get really far in the practice. But he would also recommend, though, that people practice metta as a kind of a framework practice. In other words, first thing in the morning, spread goodwill to all beings. Last thing at night, goodwill to all beings. It frames the day to remind you why you're practicing. The fact that you want happiness is something taken for granted. The fact that you want a happiness that doesn't harm anybody, that's an attitude that has to be cultivated. And so as you think about what you're going to do and say and think, you want to have in the back of your mind that I don't want anyone to be harmed. And that gives a structure to your practice. And then within the context of that, then you do the rest of the practice. You're generous. You observe the precepts. You try to train the mind to get rid of its greed, aversion, and delusion. Because this practice is a way of showing goodwill to yourself and all other living beings. These are ways of finding happiness that harm no one. The problem is, even within the framework, and no matter how much you do metta practice, there are times when anger comes up. Now, anger is different from ill will. Ill will is wishing to see someone suffer. Anger is just out and out aversion. It can come in many levels of strength. So even though you set your mind on metta, you find it slipping back. So you have to look at why. Part of it, of course, is that we're very good at anger. It comes very easily to us. We can go to zero to outrage in one sixtieth of a second. But you have to remember, it's something that's fabricated. It's a habit you've developed. I remember watching my niece grow up. And for a long time she was very docile. Then when she, one day she visited another family, and one of the kids in the family threw a tantrum. And two days later, Gigi threw another tantrum. She'd gotten an idea. The thing is, if you live with people who are that way, it's very easy to pick up their habits. And very easy to see that if you don't show your anger, they're going to push. People are going to push you around. So your way of freeing yourself from what you don't like is to get angry. That's a perception you have to look into. Because if you allow anger to take over, there are a lot of things you don't see. And can you, do, you can do a lot of damage to yourself and other people. So here it's good to remember the Buddha's way of analyzing emotions down into those three kinds of fabrication. One, the way you breathe. Two. Direct a thought and evaluation, which means the way you talk to yourself about things. And then three, mental fabrication, which are feelings and perceptions. So when we fabricate anger, one, we breathe in a certain way that gets the breath all constricted. And two, we focus on why. It's good to get angry, and why that particular person deserves your anger, and why it's perfectly okay for you to think those thoughts and to act on them. And then finally, look at the perceptions. What images are you holding in your mind? One of them is that <clears throat> if you don't show your anger, you're going to be victimized. Another is that in passing judgment on others, you're very far away from them. You're way above them. So you're not going to be affected by your judgment. And that's for feelings. The way we breathe, even though we may not consciously think of it, but the way we breathe aggravates a sense of having something inside you that you've got to get out. And part of you will say, well, the only way of getting it out is either to express the anger or to bottle it up and get cancer. So you just let it go. 
let it out. So the Buddha offers alternative ways of fabricating these things. The first, of course, is by the way you breathe. But you have to have a motivation. This is what goodwill does. It reminds you that you've got, for the sake of your own happiness and the happiness of others, you've got to learn to get some control over your anger. And so look at the way you breathe. Can you breathe in a calm way even though other people are doing outrageous things? You remind yourself at the very least, if you can breathe calmly, you can think more calmly. And calm thinking doesn't mean just not caring. It means looking at the situation as it really is, rather than through the eyes of the, the red eyes of anger. And wherever you find that you've built up feelings of tension or tightness in the body through the way you've been breathing, okay, breathe through those. Because that gives you the alternative to getting it out by expressing the anger or bottling it up. Here's a third way of dealing with it. You dissolve it. You dissolve those feelings in the body. And then you look at the way you think about things. Goodwill is not the only antidote to anger. You can try Sangwega, thinking about how petty a lot of the issues are that we get angry about, and how someday we're all going to be in our graves, and it's not going to matter that much. And here we are creating karma with one another, and it just drags us down. Think of the Buddha's image of human beings as being like fish in a dwindling pond. The water's drying up, and the fish are struggling over that last little patch of water. And it doesn't really matter who wins, they're all going to die. And you think about that, it gives you a sense of real compassion for those poor fish, and then compassion for the people that are struggling and struggling and struggling and trying to grab their happiness and snatch it away from others, and then they're going to suffer as a result. As the Buddha says, if you find someone who has no good qualities at all that you can focus on to help alleviate your anger, then you've got to have compassion for that person, because the person's really digging themselves into a hole. And then remind yourself that by expressing your anger, you're not necessarily getting out of a bad situation. All too often you're making it worse. I think I've told the story of my grandfather teaching my older brother. If you went to school, my grandfather did not like the names that my mother gave to, to her sons. He was a farm boy, and we were farm boys, but my mother gave us fancy names. My brother's name was Galen, and my grandfather could think of all kinds of ways that the kids would make fun of his name. He had been a boxer when he was younger, so before Galen went to school in first grade, he taught Galen how to box. So they tried sparring a little bit, and he taught him a, different, a few different moves. And then he started getting more aggressive, and Galen lost it and started flailing. And Grandpa put his head on Galen's head to stop him. He said, look, when you get angry like that, you've got to grow cold. Then you can punch the other guy. If you just give in to your anger, you flail around and you open yourself up to all kinds of problems. So hold that image in mind. The Buddha's not saying when you should kill your anger, that you should also kill your desire to improve things in the world. That's not the case. It's just that when you can get past your anger, then you can see things more clearly. So change the storyline and change the perceptions. The perception that anger is what frees you. Anger is what, actually what ties you down. Excuse your perceptions. So all this falls under that principle that we tend to fabricate our experience of the world, our emotions, out of ignorance, and as a result we suffer. And the problem with anger is that it takes that sense of suffering and it blames it on somebody outside. You're already making yourself suffer, and then on top of it, someone does something that you don't like. And you feel the suffering inside, and then you attribute it to what they're doing. 
and it just compounds things. So you've got to turn around and look, how are you fabricating your present experience? Do this with knowledge. And then it becomes part of the path. Look at the Buddhist teachings on breath meditation. The first chapter I do get sensitive to the breath, and then you get sensitive to what he calls bodily fabrication, i.e. the impact that the breath has on the body, and then through the body how it has an impact on the mind. And then you calm that. You let the breath fill the body, and then you calm the effect of the breath. Then in the second tetrad, you get sensitive to ways of breathing that give rise to pleasure and rapture, and then you notice how they have an Im impact on the mind. In other words, you're sensitive to metal fabrication, seeing how those feelings and the perceptions have an impact on the mind, and then you adjust the feelings and the perceptions so they calm the mind down. In the meantime, you're talking to yourself about this. That's verbal fabrication. So you're using the breath as a way of getting more sensitive to how you fabricate things. Look for the way you breathe, look for the storylines you're telling yourself, look for the perceptions, the images you're holding in mind. And say, okay, to get past this particular habit, I need to develop new habits of fabrication. The Buddha gives you lots and lots of images to hold in mind, lots of ways of thinking, and he gives you those instructions in the breath. He gives you basically instructions how to fabricate well. And part of the mind may object and say, well, this doesn't seem natural. It's all fabrication to begin with, and the reason why some things seem natural is because you've been doing them for a lot, a long time. And you can't really blame the habits you picked up from your parents on them or your family on them, because after all, it's that chant we have, we have, we're related through our actions. If you didn't already have those kinds of tendencies, you wouldn't have been born in that kind of family. So it doesn't do any good to try to trace back where did this habit begin with. Trace down right now. How are you doing it right now? And is it really in your best interest to keep on doing it? And if you have trouble imagining other ways of doing it, well, look at what the Buddha has to teach. Look around you for good examples around you. And then try to start fabricating your experience with knowledge, keeping in mind that larger context that we're here to find happiness in a way that doesn't harm anybody. Metta, goodwill, as the Buddha said, is a form of mindfulness. It's a recollection. As I said, the desire for happiness is taken for granted. The realization that we if we really do want to find happiness, we have to have goodwill for all. That's something we have to train ourselves in. We have to determine ourselves that this is what we're going to do. We're going to keep this in mind as we speak, as we think, as we act. So we can straighten out our ideas about where our suffering is coming from. And find that harmless happiness that we deep down really want.